number of people. Um, so this is the latest in our leadership webinar series, and that's one of the uh, national events we run for the Women's Network. Um, and I'm particularly excited in Wait, have I been muted all that time or could you hear me? Right, I'll start again. You're back again. You weren't reached for the first bit, Sarah, but then you disappeared and now you've come back again. I'm going to start again. I'm going to be very calm and speed. And uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to this latest in uh, our leadership webinar series, one of the, um, the national series of events that we run for the uh, Women's Network. And uh, our guest this morning is Judith Batchelor. Um, and I'm really excited and pleased to have Judith here. And I'll, I'll come back to Judith in a moment. But um, first, just a few housekeeping points about how we're going to run this. Um, you'll have seen that we are recording the event so that anybody who couldn't take part live uh, can, can watch it later on the website. Um, for the first part, um, we will turn off your cameras and microphones um, so that it's, uh, it focuses on me and Judith. But uh, once we get to the question part, please do turn your cameras uh, on so that it's a bit more friendly and, and a bit more of a, um, a less anonymous event, particularly for Judith, who doesn't know you all. And if you'd like to say something um, later on, um, please use the raise hand function, which certainly on my machine is in the reactions tab. Um, or you can just put something in the chat bar and we'll, we'll come to you. And I'll, I'll um, invite you to come in um, as and when. And lastly, please, could you make sure that your name is uh, on the screen and not somebody else's, just so that I don't invite somebody completely different to come in. Um, and I think you can do that by sort of clicking on the, the three dots in the corner of your, uh, in the corner of your screen. So, uh, <clears throat> preliminaries over. Let's get on with the main uh, the main event. And Judith is one of those people whose names get mentioned very quickly whenever there's a discussion about who to invite to be on a committee or a group or to bring in, particularly when it's about food and farming. But uh, as you'll see, it's not limited to food and farming. Um, and I I admit that I always expect such um, people to be a bit scary. Um, they're, they're sort of their aura goes before them. But I very clearly remember my first meeting with Judith um, back when I was responsible for water policy in uh, DEFRA. And there was absolutely nothing at all about Judith that was um, scary. She was charm and friendliness personified um, and uh, not at all the sort of caricature that does go around about ruthless retailers and, and what have you. And we had a really fizzy discussion with lots of ideas and, and interesting things to talk about. So she is, uh, and she's really the sort of person who, who goes beyond just talking about things. And she's one of those people who makes things happen. Um, and those things are often about sustainability in its, in its many forms. Um, and I think Judith has been focused on this um, since way before it became the much more mainstream um, and topical thing that it is these days. So Judith, a very, very warm welcome to the CLA Women's Network, which is quite a recent thing. Um, and, and as you can see, we've, we've got quite an enthusiastic group of people here. Um, I've really been looking forward to having more of a chat with you because when we do meet, we tend to talk yeah. business. So this could be a little bit more personal, I hope. So for starters, as Sainsbury's Director of Brand, you've been the face of many of Sainsbury's sort of corporate social responsibility policies. Um, but I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how you got there, what inspired you to yep. go into food retail? Were you one of those people who, from a very early age, knew that was what you wanted to do? No, not, not at all. But, but um, first of all, thank you for inviting me, because I'm, I'm actually really excited about this as well, actually, because um, it's not often you get to 
just to talk about the things that are really important to you. Most people invite you along and then give you an agenda about what they want to, you to speak about. So this is lovely. So I've got the ability to freestyle. So, um, <laughs> and I hope I, um, works <laughs> for everyone. But no, I, I um, grew up in a small village in the New Forest, actually. Um, both my parents were teachers and all my family were teachers, in fact, cousins, sisters, brothers, you know, the, um, it was the family thing. And, and I really didn't want to teach, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but I knew that having had instilled in me at a very early age, the importance of learning, and we didn't talk about lifelong learning in those days, but, but essentially that's what my parents did and that's what they instilled in me, you know, be interested in people, be interested in things, um, be kind, work hard and encourage others to do the same. That was the sort of mantra. So I worked hard at school and I did well at school and everyone said that I should be a doctor. So I applied to medical school and, and did really badly in my A-levels. Um, so instead of getting three A's and going to medical school, I got three C's and a D and went to um, Surrey University to study uh, medical biochemistry. Uh, medical biochemistry had um, attached to it um, one of the first departments of nutrition and food science in the country. And I thought this was a fascinating subject. I mean, I really loved it, um, but I was a biochemist. So um, I went to work for a pharmaceutical company, didn't like that. Um, and this, this will date me. My mother said to me, well, if you, if you don't want to be a scientific research you know, person working in a laboratory, you could do no worse than be a teacher because when you get married and have children, you'll get the school holidays off. So off I went and trained to be a teacher. Um, and I didn't, um, I, I liked teaching. I didn't like the politics of teaching. And uh, I taught at a boys school in Southeast London and it, it was tough, but it was it was good fun, and they were good fun, and and that, and if it hadn't been just teaching those boys, then that would have been fine. But it wasn't, so I I then couldn't go back to university because I think my parents would have had a sense of humour failure. So I went to work for Bass, who were a brewer at the time. This was before the beer laws and all the pubs and brewery tied relationships was set up. So. I went to brewing after brewing um, and that was brilliant actually because they put me on a two-year wine diploma course. I won a scholarship from the Scotch Whiskey Association and spent a year studying Scotch whiskey and that love has never left me. Um, but um, I I'd, I'd, I'd sort of was going nowhere and in those days there were, there were no women, senior women in brewing and pubs and I remember applying for a role and the marketing director saying to me, it's really great, Judith, but we cannot give this role to a woman because it's a premium beer brand um, and it's just got to go to a man. Um, and I, I remember saying to him, I understand. And I did understand because that's the way it was. But anyway, that, I thought that's not for me. I, I need to leave. So I then moved from, from beer and wine to chocolate and went to work for Mars which was an American company, um, lots of, of senior women and what they described, which I'd never heard of in those days as a meritocracy. Um, and I loved it. And I met some really interesting people who were gonna be my bosses of the future. So people like Justin King, Alan Layton, Richard Baker, David Cheeswright, they all went on to be CEOs of big retailers. And, it, and I really sort of learned my craft there. Um, Went from there to Marks and Spencer, spent 12 years there, had my children, got married, uh, went from there to Safeway. And then Morrison's bought Safeway. I was made redundant. Justin King, this was 17 years ago, had gone to um, uh, Sainsbury's, rang me up and said, I, I need someone like you, Judith, um, come and join us. And, and, that, and then I say the rest was history. But when I look back on it, um, I think food has always been in my DNA. So I grew up um, next to the Merrick estate. I was surrounded by 
the children of farmers at school in this school that my mother taught at for 37 years. Um, I had grandparents who had gone to Canada in the war to find work, after the war rather, to find work in the depression. My grandfather had worked for Canada Dairies. And when he came back to the UK, he set up his own bakery with a few shops and a, and a grocery store. And I used to spend all my school holidays putting jam in the donuts. Um, and as a sort of, I mean, completely illegal, of course, because I was about seven or eight years old, um, working in the bakery with my grandfather and uncle. Um, food has always been in my DNA, but of course, it's changed massively. This industry that I joined um, in the 1980s, um, when we didn't have standards, we didn't have specifications. Uh, when we selected a product or developed a product, we, we kept a sample and we put the sample in the freezer. And when we did our quality control as it was then, the most that we could ever come up with is, it's not as I remember it. Um, not that it's a specification and it's this bricks and it's this pH and it looks like this and we can measure that color on a spectrometer. It was completely intuitive. And even then, you know, things like sustainability was a conversation before the AGM that was, you know what, Judith, what are we going to get asked tomorrow? What's the hot topic? And you'd say, I don't know, dolphin friendly tuna. And they say, what do we do about it? And do we need to stick a logo on the can? And, and I'd say, yes, that's a good idea. And perhaps we ought to do some work to find out what dolphin friendly tuna really means. And, and that was way before things like the Marine Stewardship Council. So yeah, I joined an industry that, that bears no resemblance to the industry today. And, and say, when, you, when you, sorry yeah. to you, but it, you know, with your biochemistry background, did, were you initially much more on sort of thinking about quality and standards and things, and then you, you gradually moved across to the policy issues that you're Yes, about? yeah. No, I, I started my life very much on the technical side of things, um, as both from a nutrition point of view and from a food safety um, technology point of view, food science point of view, and, and I'd always worked in sort of close working a partnership with the supply chain partners that we had, and and particularly lucky to have done that at m &S actually, because um, small number of suppliers, long standing deep relationships where it really was a partnership and, and nothing um really was was um what's the word hidden between partners everybody knew everything and we it, it was it was the best um, example of what i would call open book so yeah no interesting interesting times people can't believe it when i describe how it was and was it um you know you, you you started to talk about sustainability and you had that example of dolphin friendly tuna and what have you yes you know at what point did that become a job and a role and have an importance that then meant that somebody like you had to be responsible for it um as opposed to just just a bit of marketing yeah I, and i it was a long journey actually because i think in the early 90s there was an explosion um, well, the explosion of two things really. Lots of regulation um, from Europe, you know, so the, the food regulations grew exponentially. And at the same time, um, voluntary standards from people like the Marine Stewardship Council, um, the Forestry Stewardship Council, RSPCA, Fair Trade. And literally, there was, a, there was an outbreak of, of all of these production standards. But they were really needed at the time because um, people could make claims about things that really weren't um, necessarily true. And I mean, we've probably got the same problem now with greenwashing and claims around carbon footprints and biodiversity. But in those days, it was something, you know, more basic. Um, and those things um, sort of crossed the boundary between what I would call nice to do, 
because it's good to look after the oceans and to create sustainable fisheries, um, so on and so forth. Um, and, and what is now mandatory requirements for things, you know, so illegally caught fish, for example, or, um, you know, what's coming in terms of regulation on deforestation, free supply chains and illegal timber. Uh, those things were nice to do. And people used to make all sorts of claims about all sorts of things that simply could not be verified, could not, there were no assurance schemes. But of course, you know, that's nearly 30 years ago um, and things have moved on and we're, we're much more data driven, technology driven, scientific evidence, isotope testing to, to understand whether those eggs really are British eggs and um, testing, you know, for DNA to ensure that species that shouldn't be in your you know, beef burgers, um, you know, really are beef. Uh, all of the things that we've we've grown up with over the last sort of 10, 15 years, really, it's, it bears no resemblance to the industry that I grew grew up in as a as a young um, enthusiastic technologist. <laughs> and do you think that um, all of those things now are genuinely mainstream? Because you know that sounds like that's that's been one of the things that you've really championed. Um, you've now left Sainsbury's, um, but do you feel it's unfinished business, or that actually you know you've kind of done your job and you can afford now to move on and do something slightly different? Uh, it's never finished, is it? Uh, I I think it's quite interesting now because if you look at some, um, if you take all of those schemes, for example, like MSC, FSC, RSPCA, so on and so forth. Um, they have become mainstream. So if you'd said 10 years ago, would Aldi be one of the biggest retailers of RSPCA assured pork? You'd have probably said, really? No, no, it will be M&S or it will be co-op or it will be Sainsbury's. Um, but, you know, they are today. And, and those schemes have been pretty much become what I would describe as the industry norm. It's, you know, it's where everyone is coalescing. But of course, you then say, well, what's the new higher ground? What's the what are we pushing forward on now? You know, is it much more scientific evidence around animal health and welfare or antibiotic use or pasture fed beef or whatever it might be? And so there is there's plenty more to come. The other thing is that many of those things are now being regulated. So, you know, what used to be um i don't know uh, um an ethical supply chain you now have the modern slavery act and you have to do your due diligence and you have to do your reporting um the same will be true on deforestation that you know everyone made commitments about deforestation but actually over the last 20 years deforestation has just grown and grown and grown and so have the number of commitments have grown and grown and grown. So some, somewhere there is a disconnect between commitments people are making and what's happening in practice. So things have got to change because, yeah, there's, there's plenty of unfinished business, that's for sure. And um, I have to say, when uh, I got a letter or an email, as you do these days, last autumn from you about uh, signing up to various commitments for... COP26 and uh, you know, UK business for climate change. I really wasn't surprised that it came from you, Judith, but um, uh, obviously then stepping up and championing the, the net zero carbon um, agenda was, was, I suppose, the, almost the last thing you did before you uh, left Sainsbury's. Yeah, and, and it's... Uh, the real insight in this, and it wasn't until I was thinking about this the other day that it dawned on me, was that I'd spent years getting um, to the point where we'd got a net zero commitment um, and many iterations and negotiations and ended up with net zero um, scope one and two. So only within your own operations, which if you're a retailer, is probably only 3% of your impact, 97% is in your value chains. So it was scope one and two. Um, it was um, basically net zero by 2040. 
in the space of two years, that, that commitment moved to scope one, two, and three, um, and net zero by 2030. Um, speed at which those commitments have moved has been remarkable. What, what is really interesting is uh, the how to achieve those commitments has not moved quite so quickly. So you've got a bit of a gap between the ambition, which is brilliant because we want bold ambition. We've got to move fast. We've got to move at scale. But at the same time, um, we, we haven't necessarily got the tools to do the job. So whilst we've got great data and science, we do not have good methodologies for measuring greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and, and many of you will all know that because, you know, the number of different carbon calculator tools, the number of different databases you can use as a reference, um, some of that data is really old and so on and so forth. So there's, there's ambition, but we haven't quite got the tools to do the job yet. So that's one of the things that I'm working on, uh, or working hard on at the moment, actually. Given that sort of lag between ambition and the tools to do the job, um, and I suppose to some extent that there's been a bit of a emerging backlash, hasn't there, with, with all the discussion about Russian fuel being turned off or being boycotted. Um, how optimistic are you that, that that enthusiasm that we all signed up to back in November um, can actually weather the, the sort of economic shocks that we're hearing about now? Yeah, and I think it, it's an interesting one because I know lots of people have been talking about the fact that what's going on in the humanitarian crisis is gonna put back the climate agenda you know, for years. And, and I appreciate that. Um, but I think these things are holistic and all of those things have to be managed um, in a systems based way. So people talk about trade offs and, um, you know, if you, you know, the, the most greenhouse gas efficient way to grow a chicken is to grow a chicken quickly. Um, but, but not at the expense of its health or, or the feed and how that feed may have been um, grown and produced, you know, in South America, for example. So people talk about these trade-offs. I prefer not to talk to, talk to them as trade-offs because it means it kind of implies that one thing is more important than another, which I, I don't think is true. I think in a given situation, one any given situation one set of priorities might be more important than another um, i.e the humanitarian need is more important than the climate need or more important than nature's needs but they're all important it's just that in different circumstances you create different priorities and i think this is going to force us to manage those priorities between people, climate, nature, um, so on and so forth, to, to manage those priorities um, much more openly and explicitly, uh, because you know we we're going to have to make tough choices, but those tough choices are around people and places. And that's that's something that's quite familiar to a lot of our members at the moment because. There, there are lots of different agendas for land in particular. Yeah. You know, is, it, is it about food? Is it about nature? Is it about carbon? Is it about growing trees, restoring peatland? So those, those, how you balance those things is really difficult. And that's why the, you know, the importance of place and, and the relationship between people and place is so important because whilst we might have some guiding principles up here, um, there's no doubt that what is the right thing to do in one place is not the right thing to do in another place. And, and actually we have got the data to be able to manage that on lots of aspects, um, but, but we need more standardized data so that you can compare and contrast what, what might happen in scenario A over here versus scenario B over here with, with a level playing field. Yeah, that's the that's the challenge um but but it is so specific in terms of what what is required 
Definitely. Judith, um, so you've just left retail, left yeah. after quite a long time. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. How, how has all that changed? Yeah, so I my kind of last thing in retail was um, at COP26, which I have to say was a real privilege um, because it, it was, you know, everything, um, the food and agriculture system that needs to be, um, what's the word, represented, but was, was probably not represented as well as it could be um, at COP26. Um, so that was good to be there to, to talk, talk on behalf of food and agriculture, but also um, it was really important um, for me to see what I would describe as the grown-ups in, in our global um, world, really talking to what, what's most important, you know, um, because I think on the outside you didn't didn't necessarily see all of that and there was a lot of criticism but I felt I came away quite encouraged that um, that food and agriculture will be a big part of future plans and that people are listening and that's really formed what what I'm doing now so um, I'm doing um, I'm now uh, deputy chair at the environment agency I've got um, a seat on the Natural Environment Research Council as a council member, um, so very much narrow and deep on environment. Um, I've got uh, a trustee position at Kew Gardens, and I always say Kew is the best kept secret because, you know, it, it is a lovely garden in West London, but it's also a, a brilliant um, living landscape at Wakehurst Place in Sussex where the Millennium Seed Bank is. Um, and if you've never been, you should try and go because it's it makes you very proud of of what we do as a nation to protect nature. And, you know, 200 plus years of collecting um, plants and fungi from all around the world that will hold some of the answers to climate and nature crises that we're living in. So loving all of that. Um, and then a bit of non-exec work. Um, which actually is quite difficult for me because I'm, I'm a non-exec who's desperate to be an exec <laughs> um, and finding that fine dividing line between not being an interfering non-executive but you know trying to help where you can see um, people might need help or indeed challenge or support you know those those kind of things. Um, and rugby. Um, I'm chair of the Rugby Players Association, so we um, represent all of the professional players, men and women, and, uh, and haven't been too successful with England rugby just recently. But um, yeah, so pretty busy, pretty busy. So um, how did you, so I'm curious as to where the rugby bit came from, and I know you're a great fan of ballet as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's not just about food and uh, the environment. Yeah, so rugby was, um, I suppose it was, I didn't go to a rugby playing school. My, my school was a football and cricket school and hockey, actually. Um, but um, my father was a great sportsman and I always used to go to the sports club with him and, and, and watch all sports. So I, I, I knew rugby. Um, they were always a very strange breed to me, rugby players. But when I went to university, it was where there was most fun. So um, <laughs> I, um, I, I loved uh, my, my university rugby days and, and it sort of grew from there. And I've got a family that also love rugby. So I became a non-exec and um, at the Players Association and was um, made the chair last year. But it's, it's brilliant. I mean, real growth story in the women's game. Um, you know, fingers crossed, we'll win the Six Nations and we will win the World Cup this year, later this year. Um, our, our women are fabulous and say big, big growth agenda. Um, and ballet um, was a gift from my mother as a very young child because she was bonkers about the ballet and, and that kind of rubbed off on me. So 
yeah. Not, not, I, shall, not, I shall be at Swan Lake tonight at the Opera House. Yeah. Did, did you ever have to do ballet classes? I, yeah, I, I, was, I was hopeless. Horrendous, yeah. Yeah, I've always been quite a chunky child. <laughs> and, um, I, and there were no boys in my ballet school. So I always, and I was tall. So I always got the boys parts and all I wanted was to dress up in pretty fluffy things. And I never got those parts. So my ballet career ended at about age 12 I think. <laughs> did, did, did the ballet and rugby ever come together for you? Yeah oh yes a lot so I, I, I take lots of rugby players to the ballet and take lots of ballet dancers to the rugby um, and there's lots of similarities actually in in those worlds. Um, the strength is, is, is tremendous so you know a male dancer lifting you know a 55 kilo woman over his head um, with one arm is, yeah, it's a pretty strong man to do that. Um, and lots of technique, lots of hard work. Um, neither of them get paid or rewarded very well. Um, it's not something you choose to do because it's going to make you a wealthy person. They, they do it because they love it and it's their passion in life. And, you know, you have to admire that hard work and commitment. And particularly when it's in both instances quite a short career so um you know most people won't be dancing or playing professional sports or rugby after 35 um so helping them transition to a second career is is what i spend quite a bit of time doing whether that's the, through a thing called dancers career development or whether it's through the rugby players association but sim similar challenges, similar challenges. I'm really struck by quite how many highs you, you've got, um, you've got a, a finger in, um, but, but you know, you're involved in so many different things now. And I think you, you called it a plural career when we yes. were before. How, how do you manage to juggle all of those different things? Well, I still have um, my PA that I've had for 12 years. Um, because I cannot manage my diary. I'm hopeless and at that because I say yes to everything. Um, goes back to my parents, you know, be interested in things, be curious, you know. Um, so I always have been, which, which makes it very difficult to say no. So I need Karen to manage my diary, um, which she does brilliantly. Um, but also there are, there are real, guiding themes in all of this and principles um, that are hugely transferable. So the example I've just given on dance and rugby, um, so many similarities, you know, they, they grow up and in, almost institutionalized, you know, you'll go to the Royal Ballet School at White Lodge in Richmond Park, age 12 or even younger. Um, you'll transition through, you'll leave the school, and if you're lucky, you'll get a contract with a dance company, hopefully the Royal Ballet, but maybe not. Um, and, and you are part of that company life until you retire. That is no different from a rugby player who plays at school, joins an academy of a team, they become a, get an academy contract, they get a professional contract at 17 or 18, they are looked after by that club until they retire. Um, so there are all sorts of, yeah, similarities, um, but it's, it's all food, farming, supply chains, food systems, sustainability, and they're all inextricably linked. So it's, I say it's easy, but it's, it's, but it's also what I choose to do. Um, it's, a, it's an active choice. So I, I, it, I don't feel pressurised by it, if that makes sense, because it's my choice, um, yeah. which when you get old, you can... <laughs> and and how, how has choices. the culture changed? Because I guess you spent a great deal of your um, career up to recently working in the private sector, working in the retail sector, having to be um, sort of really focused on the bottom line. And now a lot more of what you're doing is... is spread across public sector bodies yeah um you know you mentioned q and uh the environment agency is there a huge culture change between those things um so no i think the 
the, the biggest thing for me is that um, when, when I, I worked in, in big corporate life, uh, the way that we would put together a business case for an investment um, would be um, really well defined and return on investment measured guidelines for that. And, and in many respects, that was restrictive because it was done very much on the commercial value and things that were difficult to monetize like goodwill or impact on the environment and before natural capital and was even thought of. Those things just were never considered. It was straightforward numbers. Coming into some of the work that I'm doing now, the business case is great at talking about all of those other things, but not necessarily good at monetizing um, the commercial aspects of it. So somewhere in the middle is the perfect, um, what I would say, commercial business case for action that takes enough of all the things that need to be connected to a business case. So, you know, human and social capital, natural capital, um, real impact as well as outcomes. Um, those things in, included in a commercial business case is, is really important. And I think one of the other things, and water is a good example of this, and with the recent UK agriculture partnership that uh, George Eustace launched with water being the first topic, the thing that struck me was that what, what I would describe as a systems connected business case that says you've got multiple stakeholders in this business case because you're working at a catchment area. We still don't have the mechanisms for creating a systems catchment business case that says someone might have to invest over here but the return on that investment is going to appear over here. And that, that person is never going to invest that because they aren't the person who's going to see the benefit of it. Mm. And we've got to find a better way of um, bringing those things together uh, because so many of the things now that we've got to do are systems-based responses to things. Um, and we start to get into quite dangerous territory, of course, because then you talk about, well, are you prepared to pay for that? And, you know, and those kinds of questions. But we've got to face into those because that's the only way we're going to shift these systems at the pace that we need to. Um, so it's going to be interesting. It's going to be fascinating. Now, this is um, an alert to everybody that we're about to... Um, I've got one more question for Judith, but we're, we're going to move into the more discussion session and your opportunity to ask questions. But I suppose, Judith, we're, we're a women's network. And so the obvious question to ask is, is there something that you think, particularly as a woman, that you've brought to how you have filled all of these leadership roles that um, you undertake? Or actually, is it more about you as a person rather than you as a woman? I don't know. It's a bit of both, if I'm being honest. I think um, particularly uh, when I was a working mum and, and my husband had a European job, so he was away a lot. And I had a boss who was brilliant and allowed me to work part time while my children were young. But but you kind of learn to relax into things because you can't do it all. I mean, I know yeah. those, those books that were written called, you know, you can have it all. Um, well, it's just not true, you can't. <laughs> um, but you can have a good go at it um, if you can relax into it. Um, so I think what that taught me, uh, being a working mum, was something that I probably wouldn't have had if I hadn't been a working mum with those multiple responsibilities. But that ability to be able to take on lots of different things and, and not be too stressed about it, it is quite important. However, I suppose I can only do that because I'm surrounded by good people. And that's the other bit really is hang out with clever people, hang out with people who are much smarter than you are, because it does rub off. 
Um, and quite often we, we don't have time to do that. Um, I was very lucky that, you know, where, wherever I worked, I was sent on courses, people invested in me. And it wasn't something I drove myself. It's just, you know, that's, that's, that's what happened. We don't get that today. We don't make enough time for learning just for the sake of it, because it might lead to something in two or three years time. Everything at the moment has a sort of purpose and a, um, yeah, a, a, it's very specific to a need. Whereas actually sometimes learning just has to be for the joy of learning because you don't know what, what might come of it. And I think, you know, if, if there was one thing that I would say, I suppose it is about me rather than me as a woman, is um, just, just being interested in things. Always asking questions and whether it's people or stuff, um, that's the, that's, yeah, well, because when you ask people questions about themselves, you're amazed what you learn. Um, I always remember when I used to go to Africa a lot and whenever you meet the tribal elders, I mean, it takes an hour for everyone to introduce themselves because they all start with what's your story? And it starts from the top and goes all the way down and everyone tells, has to tell their story. Um, and I always remember thinking, that's a really good idea. I'm going to do that when I get back to the office. So I'd go into a meeting with some new people and I'd go, what's your story? And you could see. <laughs> but, but what we used to get out of spending a proper 15 minutes at the beginning of a meeting when you first meet people, asking them what their story is, you'll be amazed at what you find. Amazed. Um, skills, talents, passions that you would never have discovered if you'd just gone into a meeting and said, hello, everybody, great meeting today. Let's crack on with the agenda. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and sometimes, particularly in large organisations, people sort of get pigeonholed and it isn't until you just find out a little bit more that you realise they've got all these skills and experience that's yeah. unrecognised um, yeah. don't make enough use of. So exactly. I'm going to open the floor to other questions. As I said earlier, do feel free, please come off your cameras, uh, come off your, come onto your cameras and things so we can see you. And uh, if you can use the raise hand function, that brings you over to the top left of the screen so we can, we can see that you want to ask a question. Um, and uh, I can see that Victoria, our Deputy President, Victoria Vivian has got her hand up straight away, Victoria. Thank you very much for such an, an illuminating chat there. And I'm going to ask you something that's from right at the end. Um, I feel that this year, was it this year, back end of last year, the Professional Jockeys Association made a proper mess of dealing with the issue of women jockeys in male changing rooms, and they need to sort their act out. And um, I want you to give them, for all your wisdom, from being the chair of the, of the Rugby Players Association, what's your one piece of advice that the Professional Jockeys Association uh, could take away to, to start mending what is, what is a damagingly broken relationship at the moment? Sorry, a bit left field there. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's interesting because we have got something very similar with women's rugby. Um, uh, so things around appearance money and and when you're representing your country, what you get paid if you're a man versus you're a woman. Um, we won't go into all of that. But I think my starting point is the frame of reference should always be, um, what are the reasons to do something different from the women than for the men? Um, because there is no reason, or there are sometimes, there are some good reasons, but, but you start off with saying, why wouldn't you give women what you give men? Um, and, it, and if that is different, then there has to be good reasons. So for example, in rugby, um, obviously the arrangements for women rugby players who are going on maternity leave is very unique to um, women rugby players. Um, but in many other respects, you know, how the women are treated should be how the men are treated. Um, 
And unless you can provide a really good reason for why it should be different, then you know it's pretty straightforward. Good so I, I would say I'll ask, ask them to ask themselves why. Yes. Why would it be different? Why women don't have their own changing rooms? And yeah. Yes. yeah well, good, good starting point. Thank you. So who's next? We're looking. Um, Kate, Kate, is that a clapping or is that raising your hand? Sorry, that's supposed to be raising my hand. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> it does the same job. Um, thanks, Judith. That was that was really interesting. I'm starting working in the natural capital arena myself, and I'm really interested in what you were saying about the challenges around systems based approaches, and particularly this issue of how do we get investment in the right place when the beneficiary might be elsewhere. And it does make me wonder slightly whether um, do you think the government is on the right tack trying to um, push all of the responsibility for creating that that wealth and that funding and that investment onto the private sector? Or, or actually, should it be more of a job for the public sector because those benefits are often wider spread and benefits to the whole of society? So actually, is that a job that we should be keeping in the public sector rather than trying to persuade all these uh, funds that we keep getting told about to, to spend their billions on our on our environment. Yeah, I, I, I agree. There is a role for government in this. And it's always the um, well, the exam question is what won't the market do for itself? Um, and the market won't self-organize. The market won't put rules and regulations in place. The market won't ensure a level playing field in fact our market will work hard to make sure it isn't a level playing field so I think um, in my world I would describe it as the pre-competitive space and the competitive space and, and where does the line sit between what falls in pre-competitive and those are the things that need to be done to ensure the market can operate functionally you know as in as opposed to dysfunctionally and, and I think the reason this is quite difficult is where on these kind of things, where is that line between pre-competitive and post-competitive? Because if you take carbon calculator tools as a good example, you know, there are literally hundreds of them and they'll all give you a different number. Um, but, you know, the horse has already bolted, literally, to go back to the previous point, horse has already bolted on this one because those tools are all out there, they've been invested in, and um, people are using them and people are using them to report and potentially to sell carbon credits. And actually what we need is one methodology, you know, clearly that's gonna differ by sector. So what the calculator looks like for dairy versus arable versus horticulture, so on and so forth. Um, but, but we're gonna have to go back, I think, and there's gonna be a bit of retrofitting that needs to be done on methodologies, on standards and on data that is a bit after the event. But if we get those things right, then the market can function properly with a level playing field. But that does require government to take much greater ownership of, of what happens at the front end. And as I say, that, that's gonna be difficult because you know, it's already out there and trying to get your arms around it and in many sen senses consolidate what's out there, which means lots of people are going to have to make compromises is, is, um, is going to be difficult, but it's got to be done. It's got to be done. Hey, do you want to come back on that at all? No, I, I, I share a lot of those um, concerns, particularly with sort of the need for government actually just to get on and start taking a rather yeah. more active role in trying to frame the architecture for all of this, um, because that's what everybody is reaching for. And, and I think I think you're right. I think the idea that you can ask the, the market to regulate itself is um, is a bit aspirational. And, and also when the science is so complicated, so even when you ask the experts, you'll get a range of views. Someone has got to umpire that process um, and say, OK, all things considered, that is not best current thinking, but that is the, the scientific wisdom right now. And that's what we're going with, because there are so many versions of what good looks like. And, 
you know, who are we? I mean, I, I'm not an expert, I don't know, but someone has got to make those calls. So that the, uh, and, and also while those things aren't being done, it's a, it's a good excuse for people who are um, prone to procrastination on some of these things. It's a good excuse for doing nothing. Um, so we need to remove that excuse. <laughs> So we've got a couple more questions, Judith. Um, one from Niff Whitten. Hi, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so I'm just gonna take it back to food for a minute. And I'm afraid I did join a little bit late and just caught you talking about the RSPCA standards and things for, for meat and Aldi being the leader in that. Um, I'd just be interested to know how you feel about the Australian trade deal. Um, I was lucky enough to be in London last week um, with, uh, um, with my delegates on a leadership course, and we spoke to a Australian um, vet, uh, no, lecturer, sorry. And um, obviously the, the differences between the... Um, the welfare standards between us and Australia and it was quite interesting because we were talking about a lot about um, sort of the what makes up um, sort of good meat for consumers and what do consumers want and in, in Australia she was saying about the taste the texture and um, welfare standards didn't even come into it and she she acknowledged that table that the RSPCA published um, about the differences in where our welfare standards are. Um, and this lady was, we said, well, what's sort of, we're feeling quite quite um, worried about this and the effects it's gonna have on our own meat market. And she genuinely thought that the government were gonna make them come up to our standards, which we, none of us think will, will happen. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts on being working in Sainsbury's and, having sort of knowing maybe consume a bit more is that something you are worried about yeah, yeah no very worried for all, all sorts of reasons actually um and I think you know what you've touched on is the fact that we're not very good on um global harmonization of standards full stop and and actually you know many respects Brexit will make that worse as EU and UK legislation start to diverge over time and you know how you say harmonize that um, across across the globe um, but it is possible to do it and you don't have to have um, identical standards but you do have to have equivalent standards and if I use the example of food safety where it is you know there is a food safety act which says you know you have to do everything within your power to make sure that the food that you produce is safe and legal um, we have a thing called the Global Food Safety Initiative, which takes all of the different food safety standards around the world and benchmarks them and creates a harmonized standard that says, if your you know, food safety standard in the UK is X, um, that is equivalent to this uh, in another country or another country is not equivalent to the UK. So that when food is being imported and exported, um, the regulators and indeed businesses know whether that food has been produced and, if, and, and they put in place all of the things to make sure that it is. And, and that's freely accessible. That's taken the best part of 20 years to get to. And we haven't got 20 years to do this on animal health and welfare issues. But unless we can create global harmonized standards um, B, it is completely disingenuous to put products in front of customers that have been produced in fundamentally different ways and to compare them. And I think if, if you've, that's really clear, i.e. organic, conventional, um, RSPCA assured or not, free range, whatever it is, and those things are well understood, that's fine. However, what we're talking about here is a baseline. Um, and there should always be a baseline, you know, the organic or free range or whatever it might be is above that baseline, but the baseline is consistent. 
And the minute that baseline is destroyed, you've got free for all. And, and we have to define what those minimum standards look like below which, you know, no animal um, will fall. And I think, you know, that's, that's a big piece of work and, but it needs to be done because, because people, people expect better of us as the food system, you know, and, and we've, we know what happens when we get it wrong on things like food safety or provenance or, you know, adulteration, authenticity, that kind of thing. So, you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to get to have one of the safest and um, most respected food systems in the world. So why would we want to undermine that with things that fall below a minimum standard? So I agree. <laughs> Annie, is your question a really snappy one? Yeah, no, well, I was just, I, uh, as commodity producers, I think um, we do feel that we're the, the bottom of the food chain. And particularly if you look at red meat, I, we talk about, we know the market won't do anything. In fact, I think it's in the market's interest that opaqueness reigns. Um, and I just wonder whether you have any sense of the government taking ownership on things like that, because I, I think, particularly with everything changing it is, as it is, um, it's so complex, uh, it's quite worrying, very worrying. I think it has to be a quick answer, Judith. Yeah, um, I think I'd say two things. One, I, I am encouraged because I think as part of the white paper, there is something that is being proposed, which is the Food Data Transparency Partnership, which is a public-private partnership on data sharing. And it's got three pillars. One is health, um, which is all around childhood obesity and the challenges we've got around the health of the nation. Second one is environment, which includes climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. And the third one is animal health and welfare. So I, I am encouraged, um, but it will be as good as we all make it. So when when that food data transparency partnership is announced with three pillars which i hope it will be um we need to work hard to make sure it's as good as we want it to be and i'm going to hand over now i'm afraid we're running out of time so i'm going to hand over to victoria uh, just to wrap us up thank you so much judith for such a, an interesting um uh, conversation with sarah i my my big takeaway is that we, we are all, I think, very much on the, on, on the page that says the time is for doing, not telling, you know, we, uh, and, and that's what you've gone through in all of the things you've told us about. It, there's, been, there's been an awful lot of telling and an awful lot of thinking and an awful lot of blue skies, and now we actually need to do it and practical solutions to getting things done. Um, you've given us a clear warning, which we are aware of, which needs some doing being done to it, the disconnect between an increase in regulation and what's actually happening on the ground, a commitment to net zero and no way of getting there. All of these things which are about making very serious uh, decisions. I'm going to go very right back to what you said at the beginning, um, which is a, a mantra I think I'm going to take forwards. Be kind, work hard and encourage other people. And I think that's what the CLA network is, is all about. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just add my thanks to Judith and to all of you for uh, joining us today. And look out, there'll be a newsletter coming around shortly with some forward dates, including Tuesday the 27th of December, which is going to be our first national in-person event in London, a, a reception. So um, put that in your diary now. And thank you all very much indeed for joining us and perhaps a virtual round of applause for Judith. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And goodbye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Judith.